Thanks, John. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I always enjoy having the opportunity to talk to uh, bright young people who are being future leaders in our society. Uh, the title of my presentation this afternoon is Philosophical Fight for the Future of America. I believe there's a conflict of very deep ideas that's shaping uh, how our country evolves. And the outcome of that conflict will have a profound impact on the quality of your life and your children. Before I get to that, I'll just give you a little context. As John mentioned, I was the uh, uh, president and CEO of the Cato Institute. And I want to give you my uh, elevator speech to Cato to give you a little context. Cato is the world's leading libertarian think tank. Cato's mission is to create a free and prosperous society based on the principles of individual liberty, free markets, limited government, and peace. We really do believe in limited government. We think the government ought to stay out of your pocketbook. We also think it ought to stay out of your bedroom. Uh, we think government has a very important <coughs> but very limited role. The purpose of government is to protect individual rights. It's to keep me from using force or fraud to take what you earn, and to keep you from using force or fraud to take what I earn. In that regard, we think there are three legitimate functions of government. One is national defense to protect us from bad guys overseas. Another is police force to protect us from bad guys in our neighborhood. And finally, is an effective court system so that you and I have a legitimate dispute, <coughs> we can settle it without resort to violence. In our ideal world, there'd be 95% less regulations and far, far more effective courts than we have today. The reason we think it's critical that government be limited is government has a very unique and potentially very dangerous power. It has the ability to initiate the use of force. Governments have guns. Uh, Walmart <coughs> can offer you special deals. They beg you to come in and buy their products, but they can't make it. The government can make it. They can take your property. They can put you in jail. They can kill you. In fact, governments have killed hundreds of millions of people uh, throughout history. Um, government can be very dangerous. In addition, commonsensically, anybody <coughs> that's able to reach an agreement voluntarily is going to have a better outcome than when force is involved. And government is about the use of force. If force is not necessary, government is not necessary. The next time you hear a law, and even if you kind of would agree with the outcome of that law, ask yourself whether you'd be willing to take a gun and make somebody who doesn't agree with that do it. If you would, then you shouldn't support that law, because that's what government does. Or in that context, <clears throat> let's talk about the philosophic fight for the future of, the, of America. On one side of that uh, fight are those of what I call the classical liberal tradition. Those of us that believe the Founding Fathers had it right, that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are foundational values for a successful and prosperous society. Uh, on the other side of that fight are the statists of all kinds. Statists are people that believe that the government can create better lives for all of us. There are statists all across the political spectrum. There are plenty of right-wing statists. Right-wing statists tend to want the government to control your personal life. Left-wing statists tend to want to control your money, although they've gotten more interested in your personal life. The most visible form of statism today is what's called the progressive movement. The progressive movement is an old movement. It started back in the early 1900s. It pretty much failed, but it's come back with a lot of uh, vigor in recent times, and it pretty much dominates elite universities in, in America today. Progressives very strongly believe that a group of elitists in Washington, D.C., acting for the common good, can create a better life for everyone. They know better how you should live your life than you do. And they sincerely believe that. Underlying the progressive movements are three philosophical pillars. Altruism, collectivism, and egalitarianism. Altruism. Altruism is not benevolence. Benevolence is a good thing. Altruism is otherism. It says that everybody is important but you. Everybody's important but you. 
Uh, the problem with that, in the real world, there's only you and you and you. So the implication is that individuals don't matter. And the standard of value is the group, what is good for the collective. And collectivists believe that they are acting in the common good. However, the way progressives use the common good is largely an oxymoron. When the Founding Fathers got through with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, they pretty much defined any real common good, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Today, when people talk about the common good, what they're usually talking about is good for me, good for my group, maybe not so good for you, not so good for your group. Good for the teachers, maybe not so good for the students. Good for the taxi drivers, not good for Uber. Good for General Electric, not good for General Electric's competitors. Good for the unions, not necessarily very good for business. So what we have going on in Washington, D.C. today is group warfare. Always in the idea that it's in the common good, but in reality it's good for my group. And by the way, if something were actually equally good for all of us, would we be fighting about it? Would we be arguing? Underlying these two philosophical pillars is the progressive's view of justice. And your view of justice is a primary determiner of your political position. And progressives are what I'll call radical egalitarians. Radical egalitarians. To some degree, the United States is an egalitarian society. All men were created equal. But the concept of egalitarianism from the founding fathers was equality before the law. Just because you're the son of a baron doesn't give you any special rights. The progressive concept of egalitarianism is equal outcome. Equal outcome. Why it is true that everybody <coughs> should be equal before the law, and it's true that every human being deserves to be treated with dignity and respect because they're a human being. It is not true that everybody is equal. In fact, I have never met two equal people. Every person in this room is a unique, special individual. We all have different strengths, different weaknesses, different abilities, different goals, different objectives. Uh, that's what makes human life so interesting. <laughs> we're all unique, special individuals. We're all different. That's the good news. However, we're not equal. At the extreme, Thomas Edison, and the Boston Strangler are not equal. The only way to get equal outcome from unequal people is to use force to take what one person has earned and give it to somebody that hadn't earned it. That can be money or it can be lots of other things. So progressive status are in the business of using force to take what one person has earned and give it to somebody else. Let me concretize egalitarianism uh, for you with a story. The story will tell you a little bit about my uh, age and where I went to the, uh, school. One of my heroes was Michael Jordan. Uh, Michael Jordan was not only a great basketball player, I really thought he was a huge inspiration for poor people. This will surprise you, however, I am not as good a basketball player as Michael Jordan. It's a serious differential. What's interesting is I cannot possibly become as good a basketball player as Michael Jordan. I don't care how hard I tried, how hard you tried to help me, I cannot be as good a basketball player as Michael Jordan. You cannot make the average grow. You can make the average better. That may be a very productive, very noble thing to do. But you can't make the average great. However, you can make the great average. And that's what egalitarians are in the business of doing. Because that's the only way to make everybody equal. It's easy to make the great average. It's easy to make Michael Jordan as good basketball player as me. You just cut his legs off, right? You say, well, we wouldn't do that. I don't know. We've been pretty tough on great people throughout the history of Western civilization. Uh, poison Socrates in prison, Galileo, Burns, and the Bar. We're more sophisticated now. We do it with balls and chains, very high levels of regulation, very high levels of taxes. But people fail to realize is that great people make a disproportionate contribution to human well-being. Everybody in this room, your children, your grandchildren, 
have a better life thanks to Thomas Edison. Edison not only invented the light bulb, he invented the electrical generation, he invented the research laboratory. Put balls and chains on great people and reduce the quality of life for all of us. Egalitarians like to claim the moral high ground. And whoever wins the moral high ground wins the fight. Because at the end of the day, all arguments ultimately end up being about ethics. And who can argue with everybody being equal? I don't think egalitarians have the moral high ground. I think what motivates the egalitarians is the most destructive of all human emotions, and watch it in yourself. It's called envy. It's hatred of the good for being the good. Very destructive emotion. And by the way, egalitarianism is just is work much worse than I just described. Here's a biological fact. Every human attribute, half the people are above average, and half the people are below average. A mathematical truism. Half the people are above average in intelligence, half are below average. Half are above average in athletic ability, half are below average in athletic ability. The only way to make everybody equal is to go down to the lowest common denominator. I'll concretize that for you. I, I grew up in a church where the preacher wanted everybody to sing very loud except me. I am a really bad singer. A really bad it would be really sad if everybody had to sing as badly as I sing. A lot of beauty would go out of life. And guess who would lose? I would lose. I would lose. When I was running Tato, I got into debate progressives over this issue. And of course, uh, they don't exactly like the conclusion of their own arguments. So they would say, well, we really don't mean to go that far. So here's the question, how far do we mean to go? We're not going to cut Michael Jordan's legs off, we're just going to cut off three toes, right? And here's the interesting question. Who decides how many toes to cut off of Michael Jordan? That's when the tyrants show up. That's when the power of us show up. Because they somehow know how many toes to be cut off of Michael Jordan for the common good. Well, then they'll say, the rest will say, well, we don't really mean that. What we really want is equal opportunity. The irony is equal opportunity is another oxymoron. Half the people are above average in intelligence, half below. Half the people are above average in athletics, literally half below. You name it, any set of attributes. What combination is equal? Above average in athletic ability, below average in artistic ability. How does all that add up? How do you make that equal? Something you see when you get my age, you see many brothers and sisters siblings, that same genetic pool, same family, went to the same schools, uh, same exact experiences, and radically different outcomes. Radically different outcomes. And it's also interesting to even judge which outcomes are better. Somebody made more money and somebody has a happier life. How do you add all that together? The founding fathers really had it right. The proper way to look at equality is equality before the law, where each of us has the right to live our lives on our own terms. So let's talk about the other side of this argument, the classical liberal tradition, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Each individual's unconditional moral right to its own life. Each individual's right to the pursuit of their personal happiness. Each individual's right the product of their labor. If you produce a lot, you get a lot. You put the right to give it away to whoever you want to for whatever reason you want to. And if you think about that moral prerogative, it demands personal responsibility and it rewards self-discipline. It is a foundation for a free and prosperous society. As classical liberals, we're primarily interested in liberty. Liberty. Now, most people pay lip service but what many people don't realize is that liberty is not just nice, it is nice. But that liberty is essential for human well-being. Essential in an economic, physical sense, and a sense, essential in a spiritual sense. In an economic sense, in order to be productive, in order to be innovative, an individual must be able to think for themselves, pursue their own truth. If somebody makes you 
act like two plus two is five, you literally cannot think. You literally cannot think. In addition, all human progress by definition is based on innovation, it's based on creativity. Because unless somebody does something better, which is different, there cannot be progress. Innovation and creativity is only possible to an independent thinker. Somebody that thinks like the crowd cannot be innovative, cannot be creative, cannot contribute to human progress. That's why entrepreneurs are so important. I know we've got some budding entrepreneurs in this room. Entrepreneurs take the ideas of scientists and engineers and turn them into reality. Without entrepreneurship, there's literally no human progress. And what characterizes entrepreneurs? They're risk takers. They're experimenters. They fail a lot. For every Google, there's 10,000 failed Googles. For every Walmart, there's 100,000 failed Walmarts. Entrepreneurs try, fail, try again, until sometimes they figure it out. And what, what do they do in terms of their thinking process? They think outside the box. They see things that the rest of us don't see. When I was your age, if somebody had handed me an iPhone and told me in my lifetime this little box would have all the capabilities an iPhone has today, I'd have thought they were crazy. And I said, maybe in 500 years. I don't know how Steve Jobs saw an iPhone, but he did. And that kind of innovation and creativity is based on an individual being able to think for themselves, pursue their own truth. Make a list of all the innovations that have came, came out of the Soviet Union, or North Korea, or Cuba. It's a really short list. Communism and socialism are doomed to fail because they destroy innovation and creativity. Make a list of all the innovations that have come from the government bureaucrats in the United States. It's also a very short list. Entrepreneurs are essential for human progress, and entrepreneurship is only possible when people are free to pursue their truths. About two years ago, Cato published a book called Poverty and Progress that looked at human well-being from time to more. From the evolution of Homo sapiens about 250,000 years ago to the late 1800s, human life expectancy was basically the same. There was some improvement in the quality of life, but life expectancy was the same. Then something happened in the late 1700s that transformed the quality of life and life expectancy first in Western civilization, and now it's transforming it throughout the rest of the world. There was an invention, an invention more important than fire, more important than the wheel. It was the invention of the rule of law, of individual rights, of free markets, of a system we call capitalism. And capitalism transformed the quality of life on this planet because it was the only system that allowed people the freedom to innovate, to experiment, to do things that other people thought were crazy, and to invent allocated resources to those ideas that were the most productive, that did the greatest benefit for human well-being. And capitalism transformed the quality of life so liberty, freedom, is essential for human physical well-being. It's also essential for human spiritual well-being in the context of the pursuit of happiness. When I talk about the pursuit of happiness, I'm not talking about having a good time on Friday night, although it's good to have a good time on Friday night. But I'm talking about happiness in the Aristotelian sense of a life well lived. Blood, sweat, and tears happiness. When you're 80 years old, you look back and say, man, I'm glad I did that. And it was it was tough, and I'm glad I did. That kind of happiness has to be earned. You can't be entitled to be happy. You have to earn happiness. And to earn happiness, you have to have a sense of purpose in your life. You'd have to develop goals to accomplish that purpose and strategies to execute those goals. And you have to do all that based on your beliefs and your values. Being free doesn't guarantee you will be happy. But if you're not free, it guarantees you will not be happy. So free liberty is essential for human physical well-being, but it's also essential for human spiritual well-being. What about that pursuit of happiness? 
I believe that is a world-changing idea expressed in the Declaration of Independence. Before the Declaration of Independence, before Jefferson, the thinkers of enlightenment, everybody existed for somebody else's good. Good of the king, good of the state, good of the church. Nobody existed for their own good. What Jefferson said is each one of us has the moral right to pursue our personal happiness. We're not guaranteed success in that pursuit, but we have that right. That is the idea that creates the most successful society in history and the most benevolent. People have a right to their own life. They're naturally nicer to other people. Um, talk a little more about the pursuit of happiness. That sounds like a good idea, pursuing happiness. But you think about that and say, wow, pursuing my personal happiness, boy, that's a selfish idea. That's a really selfish idea to go out and pursue my happiness. And selfish is bad, right? I can see uh, Johnny in the sandbox, three or four years old, playing with his truck, not bothering anybody. Along comes Fred. <coughs> Fred would like to have Johnny's truck. Johnny doesn't want to give Fred his truck. Discussion, debate, argument ensues. Uh, mom, dad, son, some teacher, kindergarten teacher gets involved in the argument. Mom says, hey, Johnny, give that truck to Fred. Don't be selfish. Don't be bad. Two great moral lessons being taught right there in the sandbox, right? Where did Fred get the right to Johnny's truck? You know where our social welfare system comes from? There it is. And now Fred thinks Johnny ought to provide him with a, a Chevrolet Tahoe. Why not? And what about Johnny? What about Johnny? And I suspect practically everybody in here is Johnny. You probably wouldn't be here if you weren't Johnny. What lessons did Johnny learn? He learned that for some undefined reason he had a moral obligation to take care of Fred, even though Fred's lazy and confident not somebody he wants to spend five minutes with. That's an interesting burden to his son. Interesting burden to his son. Let's talk about selfish a little more. Let's define it properly. It's acting in one's rational self-interest. Acting in one's rational self-interest. And the importance of having the definition right is because we get a false dichotomy. And here's the false dichotomy take advantage of other people or to self-sacrifice. Neither one of which makes any sense. Taking advantage of other people is often viewed as selfish. Here's the irony. Taking advantage of other people is not selfish. It's self-destructive. It's self-destructive in two ways. First, you might fool Tom, Dick, and Harry, but they're going to tell Betty, Eric, and <coughs> William, and Sarah, and nobody's going to trust you. And if you're not trusted, you're not going to be successful, and you're certainly not going to be happy. You probably know people like that. But there's a deeper cause. While we all try to influence other people, I'm trying to influence you. If you let go of reality, the truth, the facts, and you try to manipulate somebody else to your advantage, you're going to do a whole lot more damage to your consciousness than you do to theirs. In my career, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of successful people. I've never met anybody that was both successful and happy that I think got there taking advantage of other people. I've met some people that had a lot of money that I think got there taking advantage of other people. And they're the most unhappy people I have ever met. Taking advantage of other people is not selfish, it's self-destructive. How about self-sacrifice? Self-sacrifice is the moral code of our society, isn't it? You hear it at home, you hear it at school, you hear it at church, you you hear it on TV, you hear it everywhere. You hear it in the newspaper. We're all supposed to self sacrifice. I want to ask you to ask yourself what I would argue is the most important question you ever ask yourself. And for those of you that have children, or if you think you're going to have children, ask yourself honestly how do you like your children to answer this question? Do you have as much right to your life as anybody else has to their life? Do you have as much right to your life as anybody else has to their life? Of course you do. <laughs> of course you do. Why would you believe anything different than that? And by the way, <clears throat> if you're not willing to defend your right to your life, you can't defend anybody's right to their life. 
of the, I don't have a right to my life, and I don't have a right to my life, and I don't have a right to my life, if none of the eyes have a right to their life, then nobody has a right to their life. <clears throat> and that's when the tyrants show up. That's when the power lusters pretty much show up, because they know how your life ought to be used in their perception of common good. So your unwillingness to defend your right to your life makes it impossible for you to defend anybody else's right to their life. And of course, if you have a right to your life, you have to respect other people's right to their life. So each of us has a right to our own life, as long as we don't violate the rights of others. Uh, so taking advantage of other people and self-sacrifice, neither one makes <clears throat> but there is a rigorous, demanding, merciless moral code that underlies free and prosperous societies and is the foundation for personal success and happiness. We are fundamentally traders. We trade value for value. Life is about figuring out how to get better together. Life is about figuring out how to get better together. <clears throat> when I was running bb and we had a gut-level commitment to help our clients achieve economic success and financial security. We were very serious about that commitment. And we expected to make a profit. Life is about figuring out how to get better together. There are only two stable relationship conditions, win-win and lose-lose. Whenever you get greedy and you set up a win-lose, your partner will get better. You see this in spousal relationships, and you'll end up in a lose list. Interestingly enough, whenever you get self-sacrificial and you set up a lose-win, you'll get better, and you'll end up in a lose-lose relationship. So in any meaningful relationship in your life, you should ask, what's in it for me? That's fair. But you should also ask, what's in it for them? Because at the end of the day, there's nothing in it for them. There'll be nothing in it Life is about figuring out how to create win-win relationships while getting better together. And of course it's in your rational self-interest to help the people you care about, your family, your friends, the people you work with, and relationships are very important. If you love your children, helping your children is not a sacrifice. <clears throat> in fact, love is an ultimate expression of self. Now most people don't think about that, but reflect on this. You're, your age, you're getting ready to get married. Big event in your life. Uh, your future spouse comes running up to you and says, Honey, I'm so excited about marrying you. This is the biggest self-sacrifice I've ever made. Not exactly what you wanted to hear, right? Not exactly good news. Um, if you really love somebody, you would risk your life to protect them because they're so valuable to you. I'd hate to be faced with this choice, but if I have a choice to come if I had to die, one of my children would have to die. I'd definitely choose for me to die. Because I couldn't live with the consequences of making a different choice having one of my children die because I could have, could have saved them. Because I love them. I believe it is my rational self-interest to support the United Way. The United Way is an umbrella charity organization that does a lot of good in the community in which I live. I wouldn't want to live in the kind of community that would exist if there were no United Way. And I wouldn't want my children to live in that. So I believe it is in my self-interest to support the United States. In fact, I give a lot of money to various kinds of charities and nonprofit organizations. However, it's a choice I make. And I think there's a difference in kind in the government taking a gun and put it to my head and taking my money and spending it on things that they want to do instead of me getting to spend my money on things that I want to do. But I do support many nonprofit organizations because they make the community better and I've been so what would be required for you to act in your rational self-interest? Well, the first thing you'd have to do is what I call hold the context. You know, sometimes you see people <clears throat> that are, you know, sometimes we talk about self you see people that are self-focused. They, they have this kind of tone vision of the world. The irony is self-focus is not practical. The first question you've got to ask is, what kind of world would I like to live in? And what would I enjoy doing? Helping create that world and move towards that world. I would have a sense of purpose. Making the world a better place to live, moving in the direction I want to move, 
consistent with what I would enjoy doing. It can be grand, or maybe it's I just want to open up a restaurant that has better food and lower prices. Uh, but I'm making the world a better place to live doing something I want to do. I have a sense of purpose. I take care of my body. I exercise. I eat right. I take care of my mind. I read, study, think. I would uh, work hard to create healthy relationships with other people that share my value. Human relationships are very, very important. And I have a rational balance. What if everybody had a sense of purpose, did the best they could to take care of their body, did the best they could to take care of their mind, worked hard to create healthy relationships with people that shared their values, and had a rational balance? What if everybody acted in their rational self interest I believe a large percentage of the world's problems are you constantly hear that the problem is that people are selfish. My observation is very few people consistently act in their rational self-interest. Almost everybody does something that's self-destructive. I had a brother-in-law, drank 24 beers a day, got cirrhosis of the liver, <laughs> drank 24 beers a day, died. People say he was selfish. No, he was self-destructive. Or he made off a guy that stole hundreds of millions of dollars from his family and friends, he said the best day in his life is when he got caught and went to jail. And I believe that. Can you imagine spending 25 years stealing from your family and friends? That's not selfish, that's self-destructive. In order to have a free and prosperous society, in order for you to have a meaningful life, you must begin by your right to pursue your personal happiness and respecting everybody else's right to pursue their personal happiness. One last thought about happiness. Um, the foundation for happiness in that Aristotelian sense, the life well lived, blood, sweat, and tears happiness. The foundation for that kind of happiness is self-esteem. Real self-esteem, not the bromide and cliche stuff that you hear in school a lot, real self-esteem. Um, self-esteem is actually a complex subject, and I want to share two thoughts with you. First, self-esteem is fundamentally self-confidence in your ability to live and be successful given the fact of reality. So you earn self-esteem by how you live your life. Nobody can give you self-esteem. You cannot give anybody self-esteem. You cannot give your children self-esteem. Live your life with integrity. Live your life consistent with your own values, and you will raise your self-esteem. That's why integrity is so important. Second thought about self-esteem, for everybody in this room and the vast majority of people on this planet, the single biggest driver of your self-esteem is your work. And that is why work is important. You spend a disproportionate amount of time, effort, and energy at work. Work is the biggest driver of self-esteem. And I use work in the broadest context, raising children, very hard, very productive work. Whatever you define your work to be, what makes it important is it drives your self-esteem. Something I've said many times to employees of BBT. It's real important to BBT that you do your job well, but it's far, far more important to you. It might fool me about how well you do the job, might fool your boss about how well you do your job, but you'll never fool you. If you don't do your work the best you can possibly do it, given your level of skill, given your level of knowledge, you can do it if you don't do your work the best you can possibly do it, you will lower your self-esteem. And for the students in here, your school work is your work. If you don't do your school work the best you can do it, give your level of skill, give your level of knowledge, you will lower your self-esteem, even if you get a good grade. Now here's the good news that flips off the truth. Do your work the best you can do it. Give your level of skill, give your level of knowledge, and you will raise your self-esteem, which is more important whether you get a good grade or a promotion or more money, because it's about your character. It's about who you are fundamentally as a human being. It's actually a very, very significant social implication of that idea of the importance of work. Um, take a, a construction worker, a bricklayer. He has a hard, tough, demanding life. My granddad had that kind of hard, tough, and demanding life. That bricklayer has a hard, tough, demanding life, but he and his 
wife successfully raised their children. Maybe his granddaughter becomes CEO of a publicly traded company. Maybe not. He has a hard, tough life, but he gets something very precious from the world. He gets to be proud of himself. He gets self-esteem. Take that same bricklayer and give him wealth. He may be better off financially, but he loses part of his soul. He loses part of his self-esteem. There's a lot of conversation in Washington, D.C. by both political parties about security. And, and the unfortunate thing is the conversation has very little to do with economic reality or economic facts. But even if it did, it would be off mission. Americans care about security, but this is not the land of security. People didn't get on a boat and come to Jamestown to be secure. The United States is the land of opportunity. The opportunity to be great, the opportunity to fail and try again, but most importantly, the opportunity of that bricklayer to live life on his own terms, to pursue his personal happiness based on his belief and his values, to pursue his personal happiness as a free and independent person. That's why people came to America. That's what made America great. That is a unique and special sense of life that is very precious for us today. Thank you very much for listening. slide of questions. We'll start with a few of them and then we'll mix in some of your questions that, uh, that you might have. Um, the first one I'd like to, to ask is one uh, from a reader of your book. It's a comment I don't think you made in the presentation, but it relates to your book. You talk about bad decisions coming from emotionalism and evasion. And uh, how do you fix that? What, tell us a little bit more about that uh, All right. situation. <clears throat> it, I, I wrote a book on leadership that I hope you read. It, it, it's not about this, this uh, presentation, but it does look at the values that individuals have that I believe lead to success and happiness, and I believe they're universal. Uh, and one of the ideas is there that, that we need to do our best to think rationally. As human beings, we have a very specific means of survival, success, and happiness. It's our capacity to think. You know, lions have claws to hunt, deers have speed to avoid the hunter, we have the capacity to think. Now, I'm not talking about being a genius, but I'm talking about using mental discipline in our thinking process. Unfortunately, we tend to, to make thinking areas for psychological reasons that are, can be very destructive. The most destructive psychological uh, phenomenon is evasion. Evasion occurs when you're presented with some piece of information that at some level you know needs to be examined. But you refuse to examine it because it threats you something you want to believe about yourself, you want to believe about the world. So you literally don't hear it. And when you evade your tax in reality, I started as a small business lender at BBT. And the number one reason is that small businesses fail is the leader evades. Things are going along fine, then something happens in the economy, something happens at home. He doesn't want to hear about it, he runs a business right in the ring. Big companies, Citigroup, the largest financial institution in the world, got trouble with financial crisis with subprime lending. They had a bunch of geniuses that could have, did see it coming, but they evaded because they were going to make less money in the short term, and the company's going to make less money in the short term, and they ran Citigroup right into the ground. Unfortunately, everybody today, your parents, your friends, if you're married, your spouse, will probably be telling you about some of your evasions. Next time you hear something that you've heard before, have the courage to face it. Be in the tax on reality, the unhealthy. And the second thing is that uh, emotions are very important. As human beings, uh, emotions are part of our nature. Uh, but if people get confused and that they think emotions are mystical or magical, they're not. They're, 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 they're things we learn largely as children and we develop automatic reactions to people or foods or different kind of things. And we embed those in our subconscious. Probably everybody here has got some pretty good emotions or you wouldn't be here, but you probably got some self-destructive emotions. I've never met anybody that didn't have some self-destructive emotions. If you let your emotions drive your life, you will get in trouble, which is not to say that you shouldn't have powerful emotions. What you really want to do is line up your emotions so that they support your mental processes, 
so that when you make a good decision, your emotions energize you, and your emotions help you not make good decisions, not make bad decisions. And, and there's a process to do that. It's hard. Uh, uh, in our case, we bought a company called Bar Associates and help people go through introspection, introspection to look at your fundamental psychological beliefs that you develop largely as a child. Any significant emotional event, probably from the time you're two years old, you keep in your subconscious. You can actually bring it back to consciousness. There's a process of doing that, and you can look at it objectively as an adult. And a lot of times, what you'll find is that is a crazy belief that you hold that's impacting how you think. I'll, I'll personalize that. Uh, when I was growing up, my mother uh, had a tendency, and I would make all A's and a B and talk about the B. And I never combed my hair right, I never wore the right clothes. <laughs> it, it was kind of like I was 100% error And I've developed a deep belief that I was not good enough. And that because I wasn't good enough, I couldn't get love. And the only way I could get love was to become good enough, which created a lot of energy and passion, not, not bad. But on the other hand, it takes a lot of fun out of life. And you keep trying to prove you're good enough, but you can never be good enough. And I expect that some of you've got this same disease uh, that I call it. When, when I brought those experiences, literally those experiences, to consciousness, I realized that that was a crazy belief. And that it wasn't my mother's idea. She was trying to help me. But I was interpreting it in a way that was crazy. And the, what that can do is it can make you obey because you want to be good enough so you can't always hear stuff. And it can also make you over critical of other people. By looking at it through an introspection process, I've been able to bring down the energy of that significantly. So I'm much less likely to make that mistake and I'm much more likely to be rational. The concrete example I'm using the book in the latest financial crisis, but I knew the CEOs of a lot of large businesses, say a large company, large uh, uh, banks really bright people. They were highly educated, they had successful 35 year careers, and then they did some really crazy things. And I think it was an emotion. And, and in a couple of cases, it was the most simple of all emotions. It was a, what I call a sandbox emotion. I want my castle to be higher than your bank. I want my bank to be bigger than your bank, even if I go broke down. And, and those kind of subconscious emotions can control your life in a very destructive way. That's a hard question. So <laughs> what do you do if you're working for somebody who makes decisions based on a budget person and how do you manage that work relation? Um, what you try to do is read them and figure out what's important. And then use that to get towards whatever you go. For example, you might have somebody that's overly assertive. And, and what you want to do in that case is take uh, an idea that's not <coughs> and help and let them see it as more more assertive than it really is. If you got somebody that's overly conservative, that's scared of risk, you might want to downplay the risk in a, in a rational fashion so that you bring their energy around that to be so they're effectively becoming more objective. And you can kind of keep talking to them about having an emotion instead of a rational reaction. How, how do we, let's go back and look at this objectively. Let's bring down the Okay, we have Philip in the back here. We're going to open the floor for questions, uh, and we'll bring the mic to you. So, first question from the audience. About anything. Got to be great to sell about this. There's a great to sell. How do you get started with the DMV? I, so when I went to BBT, it was a little, very small farm bank in Fort Wilson, North Carolina. Uh, I, I graduated from college, but, uh, and I, I really didn't expect to stay with Mike. I had my idea was to go to law school someday, but I got into banking and I liked it a lot better than I thought I would, I would like being an attorney. And I started out, in those days, we didn't have a training program, so I was a teller. I, I worked in bookkeeping. Uh, I went, and then I went into uh, uh, small business lending after having to do all this kind of thing. Um, 
I did have a intense self-development program that I'll recommend to you. Um, you know, when you get through college, you're really ready to start learning. That sounds crazy. <laughs> you really haven't got to learn. And uh, what I did is I studied a lot on banking. I read a lot of books on banking. I read a lot of books on economics. I read a lot of books on accounting. I know, I know there's a lot of people that enjoy reading accounting books. In here, but anyway, I could have gotten a master's degree in accounting because accounting is a language of business and it's certainly the language of banking. Uh, and then I did a lot of uh, psychological work. Uh, I, I had the ability to do things in mathematics really well. I have a very mathematical and political mind. But I really wasn't good at getting along with people. And I had to learn, and I, I think I've learned, how to get along with people a lot better. That was not an easy process for me. Uh, and I had, I got a wake up call, it's kind of a simple experience. Uh, I was, uh, early on in my career, I had a very young lady that was my secretary. Great, great lady. She ended up working for me for 30 years. But anyway, uh, I was uh, just cranking out a bunch of stuff for her to do. And one day, I threw something down on her desk and said, I'm not going to do that. I just don't have time. And I thought, you know, interesting thing. If she can't do that, I can't get my job. So how do I help her do better? that makes her happier, that will make me more successful. And it's something that seems obvious, but a lot of times we get lost in that. We don't think about how the people that are helping us need help <laughs> and how they can make us a lot more successful. So that kind of, I, I studied a lot of scientific self-awareness. And then I studied philosophy. And that's where I came from today. Because I, I wasn't searching for answers for work. I wanted the principles to lead my own life. And out of that study of BBT developed a value system, a set of 10 core values that were the foundation for our organization's success. We went through the financial crisis without a single quarter loss. We were really the only major financial institution in the U.S. to do that. And our employees would universally agree, it's not because we have some strategic genius, it was because of the ethics the values that we ran our corporation by and how we treated our clients and how we didn't do things that we knew were bad for our clients to make a short term turn up. Because in the long term, treating your clients well is good as good as business. And so it wasn't some strategic genius, it was a set of ethical values that came out of a study of philosophy that was more important to our success than all the mathematics and all the other stuff. People don't get in trouble on esoteric stuff, in my view. They get in trouble on basis, on things like dishonesty, um, on, on things like not acting with integrity. Those are the kind of things that get people in trouble. Stuff that uh, they say you learn in kindergarten, but you really don't. Because they're pretty deep issues. And a lot of times you get from my cliches about what that means. And one of them is that you don't, in a certain sense, that you should be sacrificed. I don't believe people should sacrifice. There are a lot of trade-offs in life. But, but if you sacrifice, then you're going to be bitter about it. Um, I, uh, I had plenty of times when people came to me and we offered them a promotion, but they had to move and said, well, I'll take the promotion, but it's a huge sacrifice. And I would say, don't take the promotion. Because you're going to be bitter afterwards if it's really a sacrifice. And there are trade-offs in life. Now, if you're going to... Make a decision. If you really think this promotion is worth the price, take it. If not, don't. But I don't want you to sacrifice. Because sacrifice leads to anger and Got the, uh, Let me ask a slide question, one that just came in. If we have limited government, how do we solve global problems like climate change and so forth? How does that work? Um, well, in, in my view, a lot of our problems are caused by government. Uh, um, a lot of, of the dysfunctionality we have in the world is because government. 
right? <laughs> abuse their own people <coughs> and threat to abuse these others. So we spend a huge percentage of our gross national product on national defense, rightly or wrongly. Other people do too, <laughs> because we've been an aggressor in many kind of cases. So I, I see government as being the source of any of these problems. Could all problems be solved without government? No, we need rule of law. We, need, we do need some act of defense. We do need some police. We need a court system that has to be run by the government so we can sell disputes. But things like climate change, this is an interesting. First, what are the facts of climate change? Uh, they, 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 talk, they say the science is, is set. That's the most absurd thing I've ever Science is never set, right? <laughs> science, that's total misunderstanding of science. The second thing about it is what we know and what we don't know. We do know the earth is warming. We know that's been really good. <laughs> and we had an ice age 10,000 years ago. A good thing the earth is warming. We suspect that man is playing some role. We have no idea how much important man's role is, and we certainly don't know that it's enough to make a big significant difference. We do know that the economic cost of dealing with things like global warming compared to human well-being, we'd be a lot better off helping people in Africa get clean drinking water or clean pools. I mean, it ain't even close. <laughs> the cost of, you know, we're, we're killing children in Africa because we won't let them build coal-fired uh, electrical plants. It's a form of murder in the name, that's government acting. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, we, maybe there's an issue at the point where this gets to be done. Who knows how fast the technology may evolve anyway? The biggest improvement in carbon emissions happens totally independent and in, in actually uh, opposition to government. That's fracking, fracking, finding natural gas. Natural gas is so much less environmentally destructive than coal that natural gas is radically improved. The United States, by the way, you talk about all these accords in Europe where they're going to have lower emissions. Guess who's done the best job? The United States with no accord. Why? Because we found we found that the test which is all about that. I believe markets solve these problems radically. Now, here's what I think in terms of environment. And I think we'd have better environmental impact. If you really hurt my environment and threaten my life, I should be able to sue you and you should have to pay. And if you're a electrical utility, you could be put out of business. Guess what the EPA does? The EPA has grandfathered a number of old coal-fired plants. They have no motivation. In fact, they literally can't upgrade the plants because they lose their grandfather. That's how regulation works. I believe markets would have better solutions to all of those problems. I don't know any, uh, any problem that a market wouldn't have a better solution for outside of you know, preventing the use of force, police, those kind of things. Uh, so I'm, I'm an advocate of markets, and I think they would have much it's ironic. Who, who would, what, I don't know how many, I, don't, I, I spent a couple of years living in Washington, D.C. when I was running the case. Now, when I was in business, I thought government in D.C. was bad. Being in D.C. is a hundred times worse than I've ever been. <laughs> On both sides of the political spectrum, it's unbelievable. But anyway, the traffic in D.C. is a parking lot. And, and, the, and if you try to get out of D.C. and go south, you can't do it. It takes, it takes you an hour. Those are because the government owns a road. What private business could stay in business that treated you that way? No, I mean, nobody would tolerate that. We tolerate a lot of government stuff. We just kind of accept it. It's okay if the roads are parking lots in big cities. Charlotte's a parking lot half the time. We would never accept that. I was on the board at Appalachian State University, and we, were, we had a debate. The money we got from the government whether it was really worth the price we paid in terms of our soul and our control and lots of other stuff. And, and I don't know the answer to that, but I sure would have rather people got tax credits and our students choose to come and they give us the money and they make the choice about what we need to do instead of some people in, 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 uh, in Raleigh and the governors and they could be conservatives or liberals. They just don't have the right solutions and they micromanage and it's very destructive. So if you want to, I'd subsidize students. I'd give you tax credits, and you go to where you want to go, where you can get them. And you, as customers, tell the university what you want. Instead of a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. telling her, or a bureaucrat in Washington, in this case, telling them what to do. So I'm of the view that almost all those kinds of things would be done better than what we're trying to do. 
And, it, and by the way, what's happening with things like Uber is that people can vote in a better way. Taxis are regulated like crazy. And the regulation is supposed to be protection. Now, if you've ever been in New York or Washington, D.C., and you're protected by the regulation in a taxi, you've got to wonder what they protect. In Washington, the taxis are falling apart. And in New York, you can't get them. But anyway, what Uber springs up, and what, how, is, how is Uber regulated? By customers. They say, I had a good time, I had a bad time. I won't ride with this guy, I won't trust him, I will ride with this guy. Market regulation, and they immediately improve the quality of service. I think it was funny, they were trying to, the tax people wanted to increase the regulations in Washington, D.C., and all the, the staff of the left wing congressmen were opposed to it because they used Uber instead of taxis. Uh, they want to regulate everything else. It's just, it, it, markets have better solutions. And now with technology, you can vote. You can vote uh, in a very effective way. Vote through your money and 